Thank you. Welcome to church this morning. Great to see you all. Some of you here, maybe the first or second time, or you're just a guest. We are so glad that you're among us. Welcome as we come to worship the Lord this morning. And uh, we're going to pray. As we come to our worship, let's bring ourselves just a moment of quiet as we think why we're here and who we've come to meet and what we hope for this morning. Just a moment of quiet for you. Heavenly Father, these times together where we catch up with each other, we catch up with family, we catch up with friends, uh, we can encourage each other simply by being here and worshipping you together as well as what we do in conversation. Um, But we're here to worship you together this morning, to lift your name on high, to remind ourselves, to refocus ourselves as we go into another week, to seek you for your strength and your help, Uh, your instruction and your leading in our lives. Uh, We come then uh, through Jesus, our Saviour and Lord, the one who died for us, the one who rose and lives today as our our intercessor, our great high priest, our lawyer before you who keeps us uh, acceptable to you, a holy God. We worship you. I want to say as we start, we're sorry for where we've let you down. And if we're not, then please, would you work by your spirit so that we are sorry. Uh, We come only because of Jesus. We don't deserve to be able to come to you. You're you're so pure. You're you're spotless in every way. But you invite people like us to come because of your great love to us. And so we thank you. We want to take this honour, this privilege of coming into an audience with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we ask that the words of our mouths, the meditation and thoughts of our hearts would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So two songs to start with. We are going to sing uh, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
just before you, if you want to sit down you can but I just suggest for a moment that as we stand having sung strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord just a few moments to wait on the Lord you may have come this morning some of you will have come needing strength from the Lord rather than rush on to the next bit let's just take some time to wait on him prayerfully let me encourage you just while we go through the service today and, and any Sunday every Sunday that, that we come and you know that we have a sense of waiting a sense of expectancy you know waiting is is not just waiting in terms of time but it's a sense of anticipation you know I want to encourage us that when we come to church we come with a sense of, of anticipation what is God going to say to me today you know, come to church to, to meet with God it's a good way to come isn't it expecting God to speak to us we wait upon the Lord well to encourage us this morning um, going to think about well I, I, something I said last Sunday um, children you might not have remembered it but I've got something to show you this morning something that I I took apart last last week and uh, at home children you might want to come John you might want to come and have a look at this because uh, this was once upon a time Martin if you've got a camera going if there's any chance that you can put this down because otherwise people aren't going to have a look at all guys do you just want to come and have a look and see what's on the floor here if you want? yeah you, or you can see it on there pretty much it's there um, it was my old camcorder in the days before you had phones come on you can have a look because um, you will be able to see things that the grown-ups won't. I'm going to show a couple of little bits of video, uh, a couple of pictures in a little while. Right, so in the days before you had your mobile phones, just, just come around this side, guys, and uh, plop yourself down if you want to. Then they can see on the phone, on, on the screen. On the days before your mum and dad had these, and they'll take pictures of you, and they'll keep them, we used to have... Do you remember these, these old cameras that we had? Camcorders, we called them. And uh, this was one that I bought when my, when my daughter was, was born. And that was 30 years ago. So how long ago was it that I bought this? She's 30 now, and I bought it when she was born. 1990? Ah, it was a very good try, but it was a little bit after that. But how many years? If she's 30 now, how many years ago did I buy this? you're doing well it was 30 years ago so it was it was it was 1994 it's actually a little bit older than that because she's about 32 now so i bought this in 1992 and it was absolutely state it cost a lot of money then and and but i'd broken it up and uh when what happened when i when i broke it because there was something i needed to get out of it it had little tapes you know um the little tapes that you had i should have brought one along with me but it, it recorded, instead of recording onto a phone, it had a little tape that went round. And uh, I hadn't used this for ages, and, and I needed to get the tape that was in there out, but it didn't work anymore. So I had to get, I think over here, this little tiny screwdriver to undo the screws, so that bit by bit I could take this to pieces. And what what struck me and i'm gonna you're gonna have to i'm stretching your your brains a bit this morning but what struck me was you look at that somebody designed that and it all fits in together wow that's exactly what i thought there's another bit here and look, all these little these are cables that go from that join it all up and and somebody um if i if we can put the powerpoint on uh Martin somebody somebody super clever designed all this so it worked all together there's another little bit I've no idea what it did um, but we're gonna fix it this morning okay we're gonna fix it it's not a problem so look there's a picture for you all to see of one of the bits that I took out of it I don't know it's some kind of board I is it a motherboard I don't have no idea but 
that. And I said to Martin, was that designed by a computer or some, an individual? And he said, probably in those days it was, it was people that designed that. It just blew my mind. And then that bit there, that was the bit that made the door for the cassette to come out. And that was the bit that was stuck. That I had to take. And I just looked and I thought, man, that is incredible. To, somebody could work out that this bit joins that bit, this bit, this lead goes onto that bit. All these little electronic bits here, these little, I think these are, I'm not even going to say what I think they might be because I'll get it wrong and there's clever people here they know about these things and I don't but all of this worked together and it went in and if we put that like that that was that was pretty much what it was that's how big it was and all of this went into there and it was able to record things absolutely fantastic but I thought we'll, we'll put it back together again this morning. So can, guys, can you just put it in the bucket? I'll leave that bit out maybe for the time. Just pop it in the bucket and we're going to put it all back together again. Um, it'll, be, it'll be pretty easy. Um, yeah, well, shall we? Oh, look. Look at that They're one. Really they are really tiny, aren't they? Don't forget the screws. Don't forget the little tiny screws. Yeah. Um, and I would probably better put in the... Yeah, don't put my phone in there. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, yeah, pop that bit in. But not not the not the controller. I need that. Look at that. How how big is that? That is tiny, isn't it? It's just millimeters. It's fantastic. Yeah. And they all go to make this work. So we're going to make it work. So this could take a little bit of time. Um, I don't know how they go, but I'm sure if we shake it enough, eventually we got all the screws. We don't want any screws missing, or it's not going to work. If we just shake this enough. And for long enough, do you think it's going to fix itself? I'll tell you what, Caleb, keep shaking, mate. Because I reckon if you do that for a few million years, it's going to come together, isn't it? No. No. <laughs> it won't, will it? Maybe if maybe if we're lucky, you'd have to be very, very, very to a million times, zillion times lucky for that to fix it. You know, you know as much as I do, that by putting this in here and shaking it, it is not going to come back together again, is it? It just will not do. It's, a, it's an impossibility. Because it was designed, and somebody designed it and put it together to make it work. Just having all the bits in there won't do it right so you can go and sit yourselves down now that was great thank you and, and it just made me think about the way things are designed and it made me think about the world and about creation and the fact that all that we see there's lots of things in the world that and I've got some pictures that just indicate how the world was not just a random thing of things coming together and fixing things and making things work over zillions of years but it's the design of it look at this you know what that is it's a sunflower i want you to look at the middle bit of the sunflower and there's a there's a close-up now grown-ups you might have heard of a thing called the fibonacci sequence and if you have a look it up absolutely fascinating you look at that, and do you see the design in it, how it works? But it's not just a random thing. It's not just a one-off. They'll all be like that. So you can't, you can't... No, that's not cauliflower. What's that one? What's that? It's... Romesco. It'll be broccoli to me, right? So, but look at the design of that, and then there's a close-up. Do you see the similarity to, the, to that one? It's all sequenced. And a spiral, look at the inside, pine cone. Look at the bottom of a pine cone. Boom. Absolutely fascinating. I've got a little video to show you. Martin's working hard. This one, children, you're going to have to listen hard on this one. Grown ups, you'll like this, I hope. But just in terms of design, just a couple of minutes. Here we go. 
So the human body also has design patterns, as do all other living systems. We all know in your car you have a completely different system to accelerate than you have for decelerating, right? So you have an engine to accelerate and the gas pedal and all that stuff. And then you have a braking system to decelerate. If you had to decelerate with just the engine, you could take your foot off the gas and coast for miles before you stop. So you need both systems. So in your eye, you have six muscles that control the rotation of your eye. If you had five muscles, you could look off to the side here, but you couldn't get your eye back. So it's an example of how you need two different systems. So there's others like, how do you accelerate the beating of your heart versus decelerating the beating of your heart? Two completely different systems for that. Now, there's also the interaction problem with that because I can't contract the muscles that push and pull at the same time. So there's a huge coordination problem. I have to relax certain muscles while I'm contracting others. So there's all these control issues in these systems. The last thing you need in a control system is an effector. So an, an example everyone gets is the heating system in your home. You have a thermostat on the wall. You have somewhere in that thermostat, there's logic, a mercury switch or an electronic uh, circuit of some kind that knows you, you set a set point when the temperature gets in the thermostat gets below that set point it clicks on that's the logic and then it directs a signal to the effector which is your furnace to fire up the heat and uh, the blower then starts blowing up through your house so those are the three basic elements of a control system and they're everywhere in the body it cannot have a half of a control system so blood clotting you have all the clotting mechanisms freely flowing in your circulatory system all the time. But they're only activated when you have a break in the wall of, of a blood vessel. So there's signaling that happens at that site that tells the clotting system to go into action. So it essentially turns on the clotting system, but only at that location because that's exactly what you need. Wow, that stretched our brains this morning, hasn't it? Next time you fall over, children, and you cut yourself, remember that little video and think, it's not, it, there's none of that chance. It's all designed to work to make you better. It's absolutely fantastic. The Bible says that it was God that made it all, and God designed it all, and that's how it works. And it's just wonderful evidence for, for God being around and his control. So just a little thing to help us think this morning about the wonder of God and in creation and all of that and all from my broken camcorder but just brilliant design we can thank God for being in control and being so wise and so clever on all of that fantastic let's sing another song and we're going to sing about the faithfulness of God faithful ones so unchanging and then Peter is going to uh, lead us in our prayers this morning and uh, after that Will is going to uh, read the passage that we're going to be looking at from Matthew chapter 6. So we can sing as we worship the Lord, as we come into prayer, uh, led by Peter, then the reading, and then we'll come and look at the word together.
So let's just come to prayer um, this morning. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come and speak to you. We can come and speak to you as the creator of the world. You spoke and the world was formed and uh, even at that time you knew us and you knew us when we were the most unlovable uh, people and probably we still are, but you loved us even before the world was formed. And you sent your son Jesus because you loved us that much. And we thank you that he spoke. He spoke so many uh, messages in the, in the Gospels and he was uh, an example beyond all others in that he was perfect. And he was the only sacrifice that could ever uh, blot away our sins. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit still speaks. He speaks to those that he has called and he uh, saves them. And we thank you that through that still small voice he speaks and we ask that he would this morning if there are those in the congregation that don't know you as their Lord and Saviour that they'll hear something that make them stand up and think and want to be counted as yours to Lord we do thank you that we've just seen so what a faithful God and we think that the very word faithfulness is a definition of God you are so faithful to us and yet we let you down so often and we fall so far short of what we should be, but we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you look on him and see us through him, and that therefore you see perfection. And so we ask that you would help us to actively seek to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be uh, examples to those around about us, that people might see in us something that's different, that they might see a peace and a a uh, contentment and joy in loving the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. And Lord, we uh, thank you for our church. We thank you for our brothers and sisters. We pray that we would support them all in prayer, that we, you'd help us to mention them and uh, care for them and nurture them. And we thank you for the churches. Uh, this morning we've got a creche. We've got so many young people in the congregation and we thank you for the encouragement they are to us, but we just pray that over the coming days and weeks that they might be yours, if they're not already. And if they are yours, we just pray that they might take that step of faith and follow you through the waters of baptism and join the church and be the church of today. We want young people in our church. We want to hear what uh, their needs are and we want to support them and help them. And Lord, there are those that uh, are struggling and not with their faith necessarily but with uh, their lives and we just pray that you would help them we know there are those who are struggling in so many ways and we just ask that they might bring their problems and cares to the cross and bring them to you and leave them there give them the faith that they need to know that you're helping them and that you'll lead them through these difficult times we thank you for all the works of the church we mentioned the youth work in uh, the, the young people we just pray that you be with the leaders help them to know what to say and how to say it and uh, we know that we're wasting our time unless you're there we don't want to be running youth clubs in the sense that it's for children's entertainment we want it to be a place where young people uh, come to meet their saviour and that their lives might be changed forever and so do we just thank you again that for Jesus, we have this so many promises in your word, and we thank you for them. And um, so be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So readings from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through to 18. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honoured by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for the, your Father knows um, what you need before you ask him. 
This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And when you fast, do not look sombre as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Nice one. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. And thanks, Will. Um, So we're back into our series, or we're in our series, looking chunk by chunk, paragraph by paragraph, subject by subject, uh, at what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. And chapter 6 brings us to an... Uh, to a new, a new section um, of, the, of the sermon where Jesus addresses not only what we do but why we do them. Not so much what we do but why. In chapter 5, there's a whole series of things where Jesus is, he calls us to aim higher. Talking to his people, he says, aim higher. Um, so, for example... Um, do you remember he, he talked about in there about, talked about murder and anger he said don't just not kill somebody but don't get angry with them even he talked about adultery he said look it's not just a question of not doing it it's don't even think about it um, he talked about an, an, an anger and, and, and enemies and, and loving them an eye for an eye tooth for a tooth he said look just, just don't even that's that's the limit, but don't, don't go to that. Leave that to the authorities, do it properly. And he's very, very practical in all of these things. Um, don't just hate people, don't get angry with them, love them. Wow, what a cool. Should I say, do you love your enemies? That's the kind of stuff that he's been talking about so far. Now, in the next section, chapter 6, that Will has read, Jesus kind of addresses a, a danger that, that any of us can all too easily fall into, doing the right things, but with the wrong motivation. Doing the right things, but maybe in the wrong way. So very, very easy to slip, almost unperceived, so that we do the right things, but when we do them frequently, when we do them often, we get so we don't think about it, or we end up twisting it round for the wrong reasons. Uh, it's, it's what we, we're human. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a law in science called the, 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 the second law of thermodynamics, which is that things, that, that things get worse. They don't get better. So we, which kind of, you know, the, the camcorder, um, if we shake that around, it, it won't get better, it will get worse. It will break more. Um, and this, this whole law, which is an irrefutable law of science, is that things get worse. And we're like that. By ourselves, by nature, without the Spirit of God, without his help, we don't tend to get better, we tend to get worse. And, and our best intentions tend to get worse. So we're utterly dependent upon the Lord. But he says here, he says here, uh, he, he warns us against these things, and he's going to pick up on, on three particular areas. We look at, at, at the first one this morning about giving, hence uh, number seven in the series, how to give. Um, he talks about giving, he talks about praying, and he talks about fasting. Now, I don't know how much you know about fasting, and maybe we'll spend a, a, a morning just thinking about what fasting is, because I think it's quite an important thing. Jesus said, when you fast, there's an expectation on, on fasting. But he, he focuses on giving, prayer, and fasting as three areas where we can get it wrong. Doing the right thing, but in the wrong way. You can think about giving this morning. Before we do that, can I just make a couple of preliminary comments? The talk, he uses this little expression. Uh, in verse 1, he says, be careful not to 
Practice your righteousness. Practice your righteousness. He describes giving, praying, fasting as acts of righteousness. When you do these things, it's an interesting phrase. And, and it's talking about uh, what, we, what we do. When you do these things, when you practice them, I want to make sure that we don't muddle up our practice of righteousness with thinking that doing these things will get us right with God. Because we talk about righteousness, we talk about needing to be righteous with God. It's kind of a churchy Bible term that we can use about being, we need to be made righteous with God. That means we need to be made right with God. Or we need for God to see us as being good or righteous. We need that to happen. I've got to say, that's nothing to do with the practice of righteousness. We get God to see us as innocent and perfect, pure, righteous by faith in Jesus and his goodness being given to us. We come to Jesus and we trust his death on the cross and his resurrection as dealing with our sins so that God sees us as perfect. All right? So that's how that happens. But once that has happened, we are called to live and to practice good things. So the good things that we do, our practice of righteousness, as Jesus calls it here, are the consequence, not the cause, of God's favour in our life. Right? It's really, really important that we understand that. They are the practice or the consequence, not the cause of God loving us. We do these things because he loves us, because he saved us, because he's forgiven us, because he's adopted us into his family. Really important, that one. And we're going to think this morning about this giving and again just a second preliminary thing you will if you've been here any length of time you'll notice we don't say a lot about giving in the church here we don't want to make it a a big deal it never has been and and as far as i'm concerned it never will and i'm grateful that that's how we are as a church but it is worth saying that we are uh, for those who don't know we are a self-funding uh, charity, we're a self-funding church we don't have um, other organisations we don't have a, an overriding body that donates to us or gives to us so to exist we depend on, on the giving of, of supporters largely yourselves um, people who have this place and what we stand for about the message of Jesus and salvation close to their heart that's how we operate. If you're new, and just grateful having so many of you that are you know, part of us now that weren't a few years ago, um, if you want to give, um, there's little boxes at the door, there's a, for cash, there's a little machine there that will gladly uh, take money from your bank account if you put your card on it. Um, lots of us uh, will give with just direct giving, you know, direct debit. Uh, if you want that to happen, um, have a word with Bridget uh, as our treasurer and she'll set you up for that um i'll just flag up as well that for those of you who do give regularly if you gift aid we get another chunk of money i think it's 20 percent, maybe more than that so if you give one pound it goes up to one pound 20. Um, if you don't do that then let me encourage you please do think about that i'm sometimes asked about tithing what do you what do you, where do you stand on tithing what do you do um, tithing is the Old Testament principle um, where people were required to give 10% of everything they had in. That was a requirement for the, 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 uh, the Jewish people in those days. Um, that paid for the in infrastructure, the religious infrastructure of the community. The upkeep of the, firstly, the tabernacle where they would go to worship God or later on the temple, it paid for the priests, it made sure they had enough food and, and, and all the stuff that, that they needed. And people often say to me, where do you stand? Do we still do a tithe? A tithe? Is that something that's required? I want to say no, a tithe isn't required. That was an Old Testament thing. It was part of the Old Covenant. Jesus changed that. He fulfilled all that. It's no longer a requirement 
from the law. You don't have to give 10% uh, or feel guilty if you don't. Where I would say is that if we can, it's, it's not a bad principle to start with. Um, certainly if they gave 10% and they didn't know the grace and the love of God, and we do, and we have Jesus living in us and we understand so much more about him, it's a good, it's a good prompter for us to want to give as much as we can. But the New Testament principle is we give as the Lord puts in our hearts to. We give, it's a free will offering. So just making clear, uh, there's, there's no compulsion in terms of the, of, the, of the tithe. So that's just the preliminary comments. It just seemed an appropriate time to, to say things that we don't normally say on there. So what does Jesus say in these verses here? Um, there's not a lot here, so I'm not going to try and make a big deal about it, but he does say some important principles. Number one, he, how to give, he does say give. He says, when you give. When you give. So, Jesus talking to his disciples, there is an expectation from Jesus that they are going to be giving people. It's not if you give, it's when you give. It's not an option. For, you know, for those who feel inclined, those who've, who've you know, got a little bit that they can afford to give, it's not for the called, it's not for the gifted. There is a gift of giving, but that's not what he's talking about here. There is an expectation from Jesus. He doesn't say how much, but he does expect us to be contributors. He does expect us to be giving people. Here the context is money, very clearly. But the principle is wider than money. It's are we giving people, giving of our, our time, giving of ourselves? Are we giving when we're with conversation? Do we give ourselves to people in terms of attention to listen to them? Our energy, do we, are we giving people in terms of energy? Are we giving in terms of our effort? Are we giving in terms of our compassion? We're to be giving people when you give. When you give. Why? What's the, what's the idea behind it? Because God's a giving God. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Our God that we follow, our Father, by adoption through the Spirit of God, is a giving God. And he wants us to be like him. The second thing he says is to, he calls us to give generously. He says, do not practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with the trumpets as the hypocrites do. Give, or, give selflessly. Did I say generously? That's not the word I meant. Give generously. To call somebody a hypocrite was a huge insult. Last week we talked about the, the backhanded slap. That was as big an insult as you could give somebody in that culture. Well, to call somebody a hypocrite was not far behind it. A hypocrite, you see, was an actor. That was the, that's the word. Hippocrates means an actor. And it's, it's someone who pretended to be something that they're not. People who pretended to be, to give, when actually they were more interested in taking. Who give in order to be seen by others. These people weren't doing it for others. It was more about themselves. And Jesus says to us, his followers, don't be like that. This isn't about you. It's not about you and what you can get. It's what you, it's what you give. Don't let your time, your money, your ministry, your singing, your playing, your, your, your teaching, your cleaning, your helping, your sharing, don't let it be for what other people will think about you. And sometimes that's hard, isn't it? And I think that's why Jesus says this here. Because again, we can all... Many of us can have, I won't say all, because not everybody does, but, but it's a, such an easy thing to fall into. If I do, what, what, what will so-and-so think? I'll do this. They'll notice that. And, and the best way to test your heart on this is if you do something or give something and, and it's not noticed or you feel it's overlooked, and how do you feel then? You know what I mean? 
Oh, nobody said something. I wasn't thanked. Oh, the number of times I've had that in church community. You didn't say thank you. Okay, I get the need to say thank you, but if we get precious about it, we need to just check. And, and I'm pointing fingers at myself on this one as well. So it, the idea that Jesus says is give selflessly. Don't be like the hypocrites. And then the third thing he says is, is give privately. Give privately. Uh, he, he says in verse, verse 3, he said, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. In other words, do it discreetly. It's very practical. Let your giving be discreet, in an understated way as possible. As much as you can, just let it be between you and the Lord. In terms of money, it's not about how much we give. It's, it's more about our attitude. And in, in, in other forms of giving, it's about our attitude. It's about doing it discreetly. Okay? Give it privately. And then the third thing, the fourth thing, and the last thing, is for all of this, giving brings rewards. Which might seem strange. But Jesus says, so that then your, first four, said, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That kind of goes against what we've done, doesn't it? When we talk of rewards, how, how do we keep our motives clean? How do we keep ourselves pure? We, we say we're to do it secretly, we're privately, we're not to do it for other people, we're not to be hypocrites so that other people can see what we're doing. So it's not about ourselves. I said that, it's, it's not for us. And yet, there's this thing about rewards. <laughs> how do I do it so that I, I'm not doing it for what I, I will get from God? So that I'm not doing it for, for the rewards that he brings. It doesn't sit comfortably with us, does it? And that's for a good reason. What, is he, what does Jesus mean here about rewards? Well, basically he's saying, if you give, you won't lose out. If you give. If you give selflessly, if you give privately, if you give generously, you won't ultimately lose out. There's a wonderful principle flows throughout the Bible, throughout the time of God's dealings with mankind on earth. A principle that as we give to God and we give to other people, he will make sure that we're not ultimately the losers. Tucked away in the Old Testament, in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 2 and verse 30, a well-known saying, it says, those who honour me, I will honour. Those who honour me, I will will on god will make sure that you're not the loser forgiving there's another one and i'm i kind of use this one cautiously because i just said what i said about tithing but bear in mind this is the old testament the principle is here where they had a requirement to give their 10 percent, but a lot of the people weren't they were saying i can't afford to give 10 percent, and so they weren't and so the work of god was suffering they weren't honouring God. They weren't putting God first and trusting him. That was the problem. They weren't trusting. And there's a point in Malachi, the book of Malachi where he says to them, Look, bring your tithes, your tithes of your grain, the tithes of the stuff that you should be bringing. Bring that 10%. Trust me in this and see if I will not pour out such a blessing that your bags and your barns and your bank accounts are not going to be able to hold it. It's the promise of God. And Jesus also, in John chapter 12, verse 26, if you want to read it yourself, he said, if anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. When we serve the Lord, and that service is going to be costly, in, maybe in terms of finance, but maybe in terms of time, maybe in terms of energy and, and, and what we have left for ourselves. If we serve him, the Father will honour him. You're not going to be the loser for it. Sometimes we say, can I afford to do this? Can I afford to give? I would say, can we afford not to give? Can we afford to forfeit? the honouring and the blessing that God would otherwise give us? Can we afford to give up the blessing that will otherwise come our 
way. A little, can I give a little anecdotal thing on this? It doesn't always work this way. It doesn't always work this way, but I'll give you one little anecdote from my own experience. Um, Andrew and I were coming up to our 25th wedding anniversary. And unbeknown to her, I'd been secreting a little bit of money away each week and a little bit of money away each month. Things that had been given, you know, gifts that had been given to me, money that had been given to me through di- or that I'd had through different ways. And I'd been keeping it back and I'd built up enough to take us on what I thought was going to be a, a really nice holiday for our, for our silver wedding anniversary. I got it all It's just going to be me and her. We were going to do this without the kids. It's going to be our first holiday for 25 years without... Ch- no, not 20, 22 years without children. Be careful, there's no shotgun weddings going on. Um, and, and then something happened at, at church, and church needed, needed some money. Uh, it was actually to do with some refurbishment work that we were doing. And I'm standing at the front there so saying to people, look, we can, to do this, we, can, we need to give. We need to give generously if you can afford to give. And all the time I'm sitting there thinking, I've got that money in the bank. Long story short, I gave the money that was going to be for our holiday to the fund. Told Andrea what I'd done. Unless her, as holy as she is, she said, I think that's absolutely the right thing to do. I can't remember the exact sequence, but sometime, I think we'd already booked a holiday, so we were going to sort of dig into the, the savings on it to do it. Not long before we went away, Andrea got a tax refund. It was for the, almost to the penny, the exact money that we'd given, plus 10%. <laughs> How cool was that? We went away, we took the children, and we had the holiday. You know, it's the one holiday we said you could have whatever you like. (laughs) Now, it doesn't always work that way. We're not saying if you give, you're gonna you're gonna God's gonna give. But I've known a remarkable number of times when he does do something things like that. But Jesus talks here, he does say about the rewards and and, and the, the, the context here. I think we need to look, we need wisely to think further afield than that because it's the reward that's promised is really the reward in heaven i do think god often honors us practically in that way he's not going to put us on the bread line but in matthew chapter 25 he talks about giving and serving others and he he points out to people when they gave when they supported others and he said come on in and you're going to get your reward in heaven because of what you did on earth and uh, in, in Matthew chapter 5, earlier on in this, in, the, in this sermon that Jesus gave, chapter 5, verse 12, he talks about being persecuted. And he said, Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. Folks, we need to keep an eye on eternity. We get so bound with time, don't we? We get so bound with making sure we've got it now. We are not here forever. This isn't our life. Our real life, we've been saved for eternity. And if we have, that, we have this perspective in mind, it will help us with so many things. What is this life? What does it matter if we, if we scrape through this? If we have nothing in this life? Some of you, this is your, your daily existence. Well, what does it matter if we have nothing in this life? If we don't have our dreams fulfilled? If we can't do this? If we can't do that? We've got heaven to look forward to, for goodness sake. We've got glory to look forward to for all eternity where nothing will be held back. Everything that is, that is God's will be ours to enjoy. That's a perspective to look. And Jesus will make sure that we are not the losers in glory if we give now. One last little thing I saw this week. It was an article in a magazine. It was headed up. I, I realized that marriage is not for me. And my heart sunk when I saw that because I immediately thought somebody's got married and they've regretted it and they've walked away from it and would prefer to live single. But actually, that wasn't what it was about. What the, what the person who wrote the article went on to say, I realised that marriage wasn't for me, it was for my wife. It wasn't for what I get out of it, it was for what I can give to someone else. And that's life, isn't it? 
We don't live for ourselves. We live for other people. Jesus calls us to be giving people. He calls us to give selflessly. He calls us to give privately. And he encourages us by saying, those who honour me, I will honour. If it's not down here, then you'll absolutely get an abundant reward in heaven. So let's, let's sing as we conclude and uh, our, our, this, this teaching from the Lord to us, our encouragement uh, to the Lord. I hope this hasn't put guilt on you because that's not what we're about. We're not about guilt. We're about liberty. We're about opportunity. We're about generosity of, of grace from the Lord. And uh, may God give us that heart that we would so love God and so appreciate what he's done for us that we would gladly give, we would gladly trust him and have this response that the Apostle Paul had. He writes about in Ephesians chapter 2, and this is put into words here. All I once held dear built my life upon, all the world reveres and wars to own, all I once thought gain I've counted lost, spent and worthless now, compared to this, and the chorus is knowing you, Jesus, knowing you. So let's make this our prayer as we respond to what God is teaching us in his word this morning.
Lord, would you, would you help us by your spirit to really mean those words? You're my all. You're the best. You are my righteousness. Would you help us to live like that? That you are our all in all. And as we appreciate your giving to us, your generosity of grace, your kindness, your, your forgiveness, your patience, your compassion, as we realize how you've given to us, would you, would you help us to reflect that in our giving, not just in money, but in compassion and kindness and thoughtfulness and time and effort and energy to each other and to you and to those who we minister to in our everyday lives. That we as a group, as we as a church would prosper and flourish as we all contribute our little bit that makes it the great whole. We thank you for your wonderful grace and your love and your giving. Help us, Lord to reflect you in our lives. And as we go home now, may we go with a sense of your blessing of Father, Son and Holy Spirit resting on us throughout today, throughout this week and until we meet up next time. In Jesus' name, amen.